Homo sapiens, human beings, we all know what they are, and there's a good chance that if you're watching this, you are one. The human population makes up over 65% of the world's total demographic spread. But what about the other 35%? Now, despite being a human myself, I'm aware of the homs that make up over one third of the population. I mean, it'd be difficult not to be. The supernatural populace acts as our waiters, our colleagues, our peers, and sometimes our friends. The hom story is out of a drastically underrepresented and underappreciated facet of the population. Even in our current climate of home acceptance, there are many struggles facing homes that goes largely unnoticed by the physiotypical populace. It's for this very reason that while trying to educate you on the historical prejudices the homes have faced, I have also gained contacts of four disparate and diverse members of the supernatural community, in an effort to gain a perspective on the world from a viewpoint that goes largely unnoticed by the people who need to hear it most. The roles that homes have played in society since the very beginning of civilization are equally as diverse as they are. Some of the earliest depictions we have of homes in both artwork and writing come from ancient Egypt. Studies of hieroglyphic texts reveal some interesting information about the state of homes at that point in history. In contrast to how people have perceived the supernatural in the Western world for thousands of years, there is reason for scholars to conclude that homes were actually deified, something that would seem impossible in our current climate. Now, of course, the discovery of these ancient texts allowed for a surprising comparison to how homes were perceived in other cultures at similar times. Converse analysation of ancient Greek myths show that homes have been demonised in a similar way to the modern Western world, with a lot of ancient myths showing a sapien adventurer or demigod slaying a home in a heroic fashion. In some of the earliest depictions we have of homes in the Western world, we can see a deep connection between the Christian faith and how people saw homes as agents of Satan and dark forces. This obviously paved the way for how homes would go on to be treated in our modern society, with Christian religious connotations running deep into how we live our lives and perceive others. But even as we start to accept atheism as a scientific basis for the world we live in, it appears we have been unable to shed the ties to the supernatural being vilified and seen as other. Now, obviously, home rights have certainly improved in the last 100 years, from the complete lack of any rights to the reluctant acceptance that we see today. In order to get the true home perspective of the issues that they face, we have found five members of the supernatural community to give their opinions on the prejudices that we will tackle in this short documentary. So, uh, how do you feel uh, society treats you? I think I do. I feel a small level of guilt that I can sort of pass for a human. I mean, that's difficult. Like, it's it's not obvious straight away. Like, if you if you meet me in the shop or whatever, you you would have to have like a, an extended conversation with me before you realise that I am a vampire. I mean. People always look at me weird when I'm walking down the street at night, but like, I think it's just because sometimes, you know, they just don't see it every day. Oh my god, it's such a piss take. Like, yeah, I'm a witch, and I know what you think I should be like, but why do you care? Because it's not all about the stereotype. I think that most people are just trying to get an idea of what I'm going to be. Like, that's not always accurate. When I, when I try and talk to the other Homs, about about it, it, I just get brushed off, and I think they're I, th I think they're jealous, and they've they've got it harder than I have, which they do. They I'm not denying that. I think that's probably why I wish I was more involved in campaigning for home rights. I mean, I do go to the meetings and the protests, um, but some part of me doesn't really want to give up that small privilege that I do have. Is that wrong? It just winds me up. Like, if I was less carefree about everything, then it would probably get on my nerves way more. And then I would actually act like what they think I should act like. To be honest, I'd probably act more friendly as sort of an F you to people who think it, who think I should be a certain way. Like, have they ever thought that maybe that cliche exists because they force it to exist? Most of the time, it doesn't really bother me. Like, I'm used to it. I'm over it. But I've just learned to deal with it now. I mean, you can't go around being pissed at everyone all the time when you get lads howl at you, you know? I mean, I can totally understand the way people see me. I mean, I'm dead. Look at this shit. Who wouldn't hate it? But I, I used to feel that 
like before I rose again and some people would say that's bitchy but if I was still normal I wouldn't want to be friends with me it it definitely hurt when I came back and like no one wanted to know me anymore like I, I get why they do it but it just sucks so why is it if we can see that people don't outwardly project vehement hatred towards the supernatural that we still see a lot of prejudice aimed towards the minority group and how do we get from absolute disdain to realizing acceptance in the last 100 years we've seen a huge amount of growing acceptance for the home community but only starting from a baseline of basically zero amount of integration to, frankly, the level of acceptance being still not where it should be. It's common knowledge that a huge leap in the rise of the supernatural was taken in 1963, when Martin Luther King, an influential pillar in the homeless community, as well as being a centaur himself, gave his famous I Have a Dream speech, paving the way for a huge boom of public awareness of supernatural beings and their plights. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream. Along with more speeches, more marches, and more protests, many of which that were attended by humans as well as hogs, pairing us with the outspoken concerns of many prominent cultural influences at the time. This allowed for the home rights understanding to reach further than it ever had before. Many scholars speak to the effects that home platoons had in both world wars. Public perception starts to alter after it became apparent that people that were hated by their country were still fighting for its continued prosperity. A lot of self actualization was made in the realization that Hom's feelings and struggles were not too dissimilar to their own. Of course, the recognition of the supernatural community's patriotism wasn't all good. It did reinforce a lot of negative stereotypes, like werewolves being brutes and vampires being lurkers in the night. But the reaction was largely positive, and the detractors were a small yet vocal minority. We can see a sort of exponential uptick in the amount that people are willing to accept Homs into their communities and their lives, with interbiological marriages being legalised in the UK not too long ago, just 2016 in fact. This marks a huge victory for those interested in equal rights and especially those directly affected by the new laws. It truly is a brave new world for the supernatural, and many homes are excited to see how much further the rights will continue to increase in the years to come. It is obvious to some, however, that we cannot stop campaigning now. We're at the brink of a social revolution, but there are still further steps that need to be taken in both understanding and compassion. How do you feel the treatment of homes has moved forward in recent years? Um, I guess it's better. I, I don't know too much about it, but when people tell me how I should be grateful that I rose when I did, because like if I'd done earlier, then I guess like people would have treated me a lot worse. But I don't really understand how people can ask me to be grateful about this. I think that people don't expect as much of me, like the negative stuff, than they would have done in the past. But it's more just like the subtly ingrained sort of ways that people think. I think a lot of that runs so deep that most of the time people don't even realise that that's the way they think. I remember like my granddad used to tell me that he served and like, you know, tell me stories about how he gained that like uh, credibility, I guess. Like, I think he always appreciated that he could do so much more when he got home. But I guess since that's kind of normal to me, like, it doesn't really make sense as to why he's so bothered about it. Like, before it happened, I could have done anything. Like, I had the grades, but it just, it feels pretty shitty to have that stripped away because of something I didn't ask for. I guess it's it's okay, people tell me I can still be happy and I'll try to be, but it's just kind of, it feels ineffectual to worry about it too much, I guess. I do love my granddad and he is a big inspiration to me, but I think he's just kind of happy where he is, whereas... I don't really think you should ever be happy about where you just are. Like, there's always more that you can do. So, yeah, I guess he's just pleased that it's not as bad as it used to be, you know? Like, you'll see some comedian on a TV or a TV show, like, making jokes about stereotypes. Like, not even funny ones, just, like, easy ones. 
And people hear those in like obviously satirical environments and think that makes it somehow okay to think the same way in everyday life, and really it's not. The issues facing homes are equally as diverse as they are. We've merely scratched the surface of the place that can be expressed, as they are as varied and disparate as the interviewees are themselves. They represent a mere microcosm of the supernatural community. Now this is perhaps part of the reason why physiotypical people have such difficulty relating to such issues, when it's difficult to pinpoint specific and actionable obstacles rather than a discrete view. Hopefully the topics that we've covered in this short film will provide a leg up for those of you that want to go into your communities and aid in any problems that may arise. Now, despite this, there are many more issues than the ones that we have covered, and there are many such academic and personal accounts on a topic as broad as this. I hope these resources will encourage you to go out into your communities and aid in campaigning for a more equal world for all of us. If you could tell people one thing about the issues you face, what would it be? Um, I think when people have a go or like call me a monster, they don't realise that I'm already thinking those things. Like when I was human, I always thought it didn't matter because Homs were not like people to me. But those things still hurt me. It sounds simple, but don't judge a book by its cover. Like, if people stop assuming things about me just because of who they think I am, or the way that I look, then I think people would, like, I think I would appreciate that. Well, to, like, people who say, like, you should be happy, you know, where you are, you know, they always say it could be worse, but it could always be better. Like, shouldn't we at least try or something, I guess? Speaking from a point of slight privilege, I just want people and Homs to know that I guess if you're really saying we're equal, then like it doesn't matter that I look human. We're all people. I'm not an actor, okay? That's not what I sign up for. Yeah, I know. No, that's why I mean why I'm like, I'm always pleasantly surprised by how much better everyone else is than me at, at acting. I go, I go to the meetings and I do go to the protests. Um, <sighs> it's just one sentence <laughs> left, for God's sake. Right. Are you ready, Jazz? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't look ready. Yeah, I was wondering what that was. Is that from I'm sorry, it? are you talking shit about my room again? <laughs> Look at this arm! Look at this! <laughs> I painted this myself! <laughs> right, then, then, it's that some part of me doesn't really want to give out that small amount of privilege that I do have. Is that wrong? Well, it's, it's naughty. Right, okay. <laughs> So, um, how do you feel society treats you? <laughs> you're making me break as well! God damn it! I can't be smiling when you're like, yeah, I fucking hate myself now. I can't be smiling while you say that. I can totally see why people hate me, you know? Like, I'm dead. You know, you should be happy where you are. Like, saying that it could always be worse. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> what? Just like Gemma in the background. Right. No, I'm getting. I'm doing something. What? <laughs> All right, cool. Nice. That was good. Well done, everyone. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye.